Good morning, Upper Room. We are in the third week of our series on this little book in the Old Testament, Habakkuk. There are three chapters in this book. We're taking four weeks to look at it. And um, there's a lot that Habakkuk says to us about waiting and trusting in the Lord, even in the midst of things that are hard and confusing. Uh, today, we're going to be skipping around in chapter two. Chapter two, chapter one in Habakkuk is... Um, it's basically Habakkuk complaining to God because the this this powerful nation, the Babylonians, uh, the, kind of the emerging superpower at the time, they're gonna they're gonna be causing a lot of trouble for Judah. And Habakkuk is deeply troubled because it appears that God is absent in what's happening so far. So chapter two is God responding to Habakkuk, and what he says in chapter two is, "I am very aware of everything that's going on. I see it. I'm actually allowing it." I'm teaching you some lessons through this, Habakkuk. I'm also teaching anyone who has ears to hear the truth lessons through this. So let's look at Habakkuk 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. This is a great verse to memorize if you like memorizing scripture. Uh, This is one of the key verses in Habakkuk. It says, Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. So here's, here's what you got. You got God. Contrasting two types of people. You have the proud who trust in themselves, whose confidence is in themselves. Then the second group is the righteous who live by their faithfulness to God, by faith. So we're talking about pride. What is pride? At its base, pride is a hunger for personal glory. It's an inflated ego. It is placing yourself at the very center of your priorities. We know pride is dangerous because King Solomon in Proverbs 16, 18 said pride goes before destruction. Pride will separate a person from God. C.S. Lewis said, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. And of course, there's some pride in all of us. We are all... We're all working on it. We all have some pride, some areas we need to work on. But when pride is fully developed, when it's excessive, like it is in the Babylonians, it's called arrogance or contempt. It's the feeling of superiority over others. It's the feeling that this person is beneath consideration. They're, they're worthless. They deserve scorn and open disrespect. That's contempt. Let me show you how God describes some of the pride and contempt of the Babylonians in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 6. It said, talking about the Babylonians, what sorrow awaits you thieves. Now you will get what you deserve. You've become rich by extortion. They were violating human rights by stealing from others and overtaxing people. Habakkuk 2 verses 12, what sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption. They violated human rights by killing innocent people in order to get what they wanted. Habakkuk 2, verses 17, you cut down the forests of Lebanon, now you will be cut down. You destroyed the wild animals, so now their terror will be yours. So most commentators think that the reference to Lebanon is actually talking about the cedars of Lebanon, which were a gift from God and a source of wealth for Lebanon. There's a lot of um, historical evidence that they, the, the Babylonians just wiped out all the wood uh, in, in Lebanon. And then there's also a reference to animals here. The Babylonians are trampling on creation. Now, obviously, these are extreme examples of pride and contempt. Um, but God isn't showing us how prideful they are so that we feel superior. The purpose here is to prompt us to look in our own hearts. Do we feel pride? Do we view others with contempt or below us in some way? A couple of weeks ago, I was... Uh, Merging onto the PA Turnpike from the Beaver Falls on-ramp. It's not a long ramp. And um, the timing was wrong. So there was a bunch of traffic and I had to, I had, I came to a choice. I could either come to a complete stop or I could floor it. Those were my only two choices. Uh, I had a little space in front of me, so I decided to floor it instead of stop. So it works. I'm going along. It's all fine. I merge in. Everything seems peaceful. Everything seems great, right? And then I notice that the car that I got in front of moves over into the next, the left lane, which I thought, 
Well, that's odd, because if you were going to get in the left lane anyway, why didn't you move over there to make my merge easier? That was my first thought. My second thought was, oh, this is interesting. Now the car's speeding up. And then when the car got up next to me, it slowed down to match my speed. So now I look over at the driver and we lock eyes, right? And this is what happens. I look over and, and this is what I see. So I'm driving and I look over. Here's what I see. That's what I see. Just such contempt for me. <laughs> That's what he was communicating, right? Just contempt. And it's interesting how we react when people treat us with contempt, isn't it? Many sinful things came to my mind in that very moment. I'll tell you what I wanted to do. His, his window was down, and what I really wanted to do was, so kind of after he gave me the head shaking contempt, he sped up to get, get a little bit ahead of me. He didn't want to be close to me anymore. Couldn't stand being near me. So what I wanted to do was drive up next to him and say, hey, buddy, you got something to say to me? But I didn't, I didn't do it. I thought it. Then I confessed and I repented. Um, I don't know why I'm telling you this. But anyway, when we, when anyone feels contempt for someone else, they are posi positioning that person low in their mind so that they can put themselves above them as a way to feel good about themselves. Jesus describes this person in Luke 18. Luke 18, 9 through 14, he says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers, I'm certainly, certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, this, this parable, it traces the attitude of contempt and pride deeper. To the root, which is self-righteousness. See, if you have on-time self-righteousness, you get overly frustrated when other people are late because they can't get their life organized. If you have success, success self-righteousness, you look down on others who are struggling. If you have religious self-righteousness, well, then you feel really good about yourself because you know a lot of things about the Bible. You even know where the book of Habakkuk is. If you have center of the world self-righteousness, you expect people to set the thermostat to your perfect temperature. Or you expect people to leave those great parking places that are really up front for you. And if you preach sermons showing people their form of self-righteousness, God help you from thinking that you have this all figured out. I don't. We're all in this together. We're all looking to Jesus. He alone stands with perfect righteousness. He was described as humble. He was not prideful, nor did he have contempt for others. But see, my, my point is, you can't escape pride and contempt because the human heart is tenaciously fighting to be right. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned and the seed of sin was woven into the fabric of humanity, humanity has either been fighting for their own righteousness or acknowledging that they need to get righteousness from another source. It's one or, it's one or the other. But we will fight for our own self-righteousness and we will hurt others in our attempt to get it. See, the opposite of a prideful person is, of course, a humble person. Humble people are gentle. They're kind. They're filled with joy. They're gracious towards others. They're loving. Whereas a prideful person will critique and attack. And they might call it truth. Just giving you a little bit of truth, right? You ever heard that? I tell it like it is. I'm a straight shooter. Anytime I hear someone describe themselves that way, I think, boy, oh boy. Because that attitude often comes with a prideful heart and the motive is to destroy, to put others lower. The followers of Jesus must have a relentless commitment to put pride to death because pride is the opposite of everything Jesus Christ stood for. The Babylonians, they, they told the world, don't mess with us. We're better than you. We're stronger than you. We're smarter than you. We will do whatever we want to do. And that's the picture of pride that God gives us here of the Babylonians. Now, where does pride come from? Pride comes from the need to fill an inner emptiness. 
Ironically, the source of pride is a feeling of inner need and deep insecurity. See, Babylon is so vicious because they're scared. Scared that if they don't viciously dominate other nations, then the other nations might dominate them. See, all the verses that I read earlier, they describe the oppression of Babylon against others. They're all examples of that. The Babylonians are pushing so hard to dominate everybody as this antidote that hopefully they that, that will treat their inner need and their inner insecurities. Another example of this is how they sought safety and security. If you look at chapter 2, verse 9, it says, What sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money gained dishonestly? You believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. This family's nest beyond the reach of danger is an eagle metaphor. So to be safe from the reach of harm, an eagle will make his nest way up high. God's basically saying, Babylonians, you're like that. Because the Babylonians were seeking 100% safety, and they did it by building these impressive walls and structures and buildings and fortresses. They say their capital had a wall around it with 100 bronze gates. And that was just a show off. Their city wall was so wide that you, they, it was said you could drive a four horse chariot on top of it. It was thought to be unconquerable. They were seeking 100% safety. See, it was another way to try to feed their inner need and their inner insecurity. Chapter 2, verses 18 and 19 relate to this as well. It says, What good is an idol carved by man, or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. What sorrow awaits you who say to wooden idols, Wake up and save us, to speechless stone images. You say, Rise up and teach us. Can an idol tell you what to do? They may be overlaid with, overlaid with gold and silver, but they are lifeless inside. So how does idolatry connect with inner need and, in, and insecurity? Well, people make idols because they feel needy. An idol is a pseudo-savior, something other than God that you can depend on to fill a hole in your heart. It's an attempt to feel strong, to feel safe, to feel important, to feel valuable with anything other than God. So if you've ever... An example, if you've ever read about Lance Armstrong, or there's a documentary out now, um, if you know much about him, you know that you know he was a vicious competitor. He won seven Tour de France races. And literally, even out of his own mouth, he had to dominate everybody all the time. So if he had to use drugs to win races, he did. It's with his teammates. It was his way or you left. He destroyed the reputation of everyone who told the truth about him using performance-enhancing drugs. He said he was clean for years longer than anybody else. He said, I've never done it, never doped, never done anything. And his friends were like, we've done it with him. And man, he was, he was vicious. He attacked people, tried to ruin them. He was like a poster boy for pride, contempt, and idolatry. Why? Because he had a very deep inner need and emptiness. He talks about it very openly now. He said, I grew up without a dad. I was angry. That anger drove him to pedal harder and faster than anyone else. And obviously, he had this amazing God-given talent. Because just you know, just because you're angry doesn't mean you can win all these races, right? But man, you combine that together and you get a person like him. So he made winning bike races his idol. But one of the problems with an idol is it never fills that inner need. And it will never settle the feelings of insecurity. It doesn't work. I mean, we can look through, look through modern pop culture... You know, we look through our own lives, look through history. It never works. Our hearts are never satisfied with it. The Babylonians weren't satisfied with it. The Assyrians before the Babylonians, they weren't satisfied. There's another, by the way, superpower coming after the Babylonians, Persia. They're not going to be satisfied either. No one is satisfied in their own attempts to fill their own heart with their own idol, whatever it is. That's where pride comes from. You know, looking back at history, no, no nation has been immune to collapse, none of them. And the one quality that historians look at that's the Achilles heel that will lead to a nation's demise is always pride. Nations made up of prideful people led by prideful people will destroy themselves. That's what you see over and over and over again through history. So let's find now the true remedy for answering this last question. How does pride die? How do we put it to death? You combat pride with repentance. When you see pride and self-righteousness in your heart and in your life, you have a choice. You can either acknowledge it or you can ignore it. 
If you try to ignore it, you're going to end up building an idol to fill the holes of insecurity and self-righteousness. And that's a problematic cycle. The right cycle is you acknowledge it to God. You say, look, here's the problem. I am broken. I'm prideful. I'm self-righteous in all these ways. And then secondly, you ask God to, to put it to death because you can't do it on your own. Only God can put it to death. Now, although God did not fully reveal this in Habakkuk, he didn't reveal it really until Jesus came. He hinted at it through the book of Habakkuk. So I want to show you two examples. The first one is in verse 14. Here God takes a break from condemning Babylon and he says this, verse 14, For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. So what's God doing here? He's making a contrast to the glory grasping Babylonians. And God saying, my glory is so pervasive, it fills every nook and every crack, like the water of the sea. See, the Babylonians, they, could, they would conquer one region of the earth and they would find this temporary fleeting glory. God is bigger, though. He rules over the entire earth, not just one little region, and his glory cannot be stopped. So that's the contrast that God's making between the Babylonians and their fleeting grasp for glory and God's glory, which is all the time, all over. And this is part of God's invitation to anyone. Give up your efforts. Give up your efforts to gain personal glory. And just surrender to his eternal, never escaping glory. And that involves repentance, and it will kill your pride. The second example that we see in here is in verse 20, Habakkuk 2, verse 20. It's the very last verse of this chapter. This comes immediately after God condemns the Babylonians for worshiping false idols and false gods. And he says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. This verse is also in contrast to the Babylonians. See, they were building and worshiping these false idols and these false gods. And in essence, God's saying, look, your idols are dead. But I'm alive and well in the temple. He's also saying, I'm speaking right now because I'm alive. And your appropriate response to this is for you to just be silent and listen to me and heed my truth. Again, God is inviting anyone to give up their futile pursuit of man-made idols. They're trying to figure it out on their own. Self-righteousness in their own pursuit of glory. And just conform their life to his will. To repent. You cannot get rid of pride on your own. It doesn't work. It's only done when we bring it before the Lord and let him put it to death. All right, let me wrap this up. So let's think for a second about how merciful God is here. You see, a person could read this and think, man, God's, this God's angry. There's a righteous anger for sure. But I propose this. That God is pointing out all these incorrect things about the Babylonians to reveal to Habakkuk and to the people of Judah that they're prideful and that they are idolaters also. So back in chapter 1, God's people, Judah, is described as being violent. It says that they are destroying other people, that they're, the pure law is, is, is paralyzed, that justice is absent and wicked. People are surrounding and oppressing righteous people. It sounds a lot like Babylon, doesn't it? And those are the descriptions of Judah. Those are God's people. So God's appealing to the people of Judah and to Habakkuk and to us today. Learn from the Babylonians. Repent of your sin before your sin kills you. There's so much mercy in that. In the New Testament, the, the good news message of Jesus is, in essence, that you'll never be good enough on your own. But Jesus said, I'll give you everything you need to be perfectly righteous. The only antidote to pride is the gospel. When we come to Jesus and we say, I need everything that you give because I have nothing to bring on my own. All right, let me pray for us. Thank you that we can spend this time looking at your word to see truth and to be changed by it. Jesus, we need your gospel to break our pride. Holy Spirit, we need you to grow our, your, your fruit in our hearts to transform us and change us, Lord. We want to live lives of, of simple humility. We want to live lives that reveal your glory and your love and your grace and your truth as we live that. Would you please help us, Lord? We pray this in Jesus' name. We love you. Amen.